said is I want to balance the Trudeau deficit that I will inherit, and I'll do that by getting spending down and getting balance over the mandate. I will also use my tax relief for young people, Generation Kickstart that I talked about, and for small to medium-sized businesses. I want those tax rates back down because they were the driver of job creation over the Harper government. We need to support our small business, our entrepreneurs, and our young people. Mr. Chong. Oh, you're going to use two of your cards. Yes. <laughs> the cheapest way to reduce emissions is a revenue-neutral carbon tax. That's why Mark Cameron, Prime Minister Harper's former head of policy in the PMO, publicly supports my approach. That's why George Baker and George Shultz, Reagan Republicans in the Reagan White House, support my approach. They published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal just last week. It is the cheapest, the most economically efficient way to reduce emissions, and it begins with one of the largest income tax cuts in Canadian history. That also allows us to shrink the size of government by getting rid of green programs, green subsidies, and green regulations. What you've heard from all the rest of the candidates here on stage is we need to innovate, we need to invest. In other words, what they're saying is we need to put in place green subsidies, green programs, and green regulations. My revenue neutral carbon tax does away with that stuff and replaces it with a straight carbon tax on carbon, allowing us to significantly reduce the well, taxes. Well, it's the BC approach, so it's the way to go. Okay, so look, BC has innovated with the tax. It has not, has no impact on greenhouse gas. How we can have greenhouse gas is gen a new generation of nuclear reactor that we will reuse our nuclear waste and green energy. I'm an engineer. This can be done. The engine are doing it with our technology. It's time we get back to the science and to our laboratory, create jobs, finance it, and and reduce greenhouse gas with real solution, not taxes. One of the advantages of being the only non-politician on stage is I can answer questions directly. So how many cap taxes would you eliminate? Two. Corporate tax goes to zero. Okay? Thank you. Carbon tax goes to zero. I have never seen how a increase in taxes that you and I pay decreases CO2 emissions. Et voilà. Et voilà. That's the answer. Uh, let's go, Mr. Mr. Peterson likes to say he's the only non-politician on stage, but I can tell you it's not my choice. As Prime Minister of Canada, I will simplify the tax code. I will simplify the tax code. You know there's a problem when it takes more brains to file your tax return than it does to make you money in the first place. We need to reduce the number of tax brackets from five to three. We also need to reverse the payroll taxes that the Liberal government has recently introduced. That's going to kill up to 70,000 jobs. That's what I would do in this practice. Mr. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Right. You want to defer to him? I'll let him go yeah. first. I admire Andrew Saxon's courage to come back from the 19,000 vote defeat. It takes courage. Oh. <laughs> puts their name out there, and I also want to tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, that the respect that I have for everybody up here goes unilaterally across. We're here to win. We're here to be a team. Andrew will be part of my team, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Trump. Now, my biggest, income, my biggest tax cuts would be with income tax, but there's two taxes I think you can eliminate totally. First of all, you don't need a carbon tax or cap and trade or all these environmental subsidy regulation programs. You can get rid of all of them. You can also get rid of the capital gains tax. And if you get rid of the capital gains tax, the government will get as much revenue back in income tax and sales tax and corporate tax growth as it would lose just by getting rid of it. So it's the only tax you can get rid of and not lose a nickel. Mr. Scheer, did I see you in on this yet? Yes, yeah. uh, I, I've already stated that I would absolutely repeal the Liberal carbon tax. It's going to destroy our, our competitive advantage with the United States. But Andrew said something about payroll taxes, and that's something that we need to raise the alarm on. This increase in CPP payroll tax will limit opportunities for young people, new entrants into the workforce, and unskilled workers. This is something that the Liberals are doing almost by stealth. We need to keep payroll taxes low because those are direct taxes on employment and make it harder for businesses to keep the people that are already working. 
Mr. Olkin, would you like to? I agree with getting rid of the carbon tax. I definitely agree with simplifying the tax system. Uh, but we need to use the tax system to create jobs. That is lower payroll tax. That is lower corporate taxes. But it has to also be huge, powerful incentives to get our private sector to spend more on research and development. We are critically lacking in the large-scale spending for the new economy, for deep tech, for our resource industry that other countries have. Uh, we need to direct some very, very innovative tax benefits to our private sector to boost that R&D spending the private sector side of the ledger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. I have a lot of respect for my friend Michael, but I disagree with the liberal approach on the carbon tax. They use tax as a stick to make people to change their behavior, but the commuters in the 905 in Ontario will just pay more in gas. The single senior heating their home with home heating oil will just pay more for that, and they're not the problem with greenhouse gas emissions. What we need is to use a carrot work with the large emitters over a time frame to reduce their carbon footprint, and then you know what? The federal government will forego corporate tax if they meet those deadlines in our national interest. It's using it as a carrot, not a stick. Mr. Chong, you get 30 seconds. The reason why I support a carbon tax is because it's the cheapest way to reduce emissions. That's why conservatives and liberals and Democrats in British Columbia support BC's carbon tax. In Ontario, we haven't taken that approach and it's a lot more expensive. The price of electricity, the price of everything in Ontario has skyrocketed in the last 10 years because any other approach, like all the rest of the candidates here on stage, is more expensive than a revenue neutral carbon tax. The second reason why I'm proposing this, if we're going to win in 2019, we need to have a credible conservative-based policy to reduce emissions. Mr. Blaney. The, the only way to reduce the electricity bill in Ontario is to renew Pickering, invest in nuclear, and not impose a new tax. It's as simple as that. Uh, question for Michael. Michael, if I'm a 28-year-old welder up at Site C in Fort St. John, and I pay the carbon tax, but I can't ride a bike or take a SkyTrain to work, how is that revenue neutral for me? That welder in British Columbia has a job and is paying the lowest rate of income taxes in this country because BC has put in place a revenue neutral carbon tax. Gordon Campbell put one in in 2008. It's been here for almost 10 years at $30 per ton. The BC model works and we need to take it and export it to the rest of the country. So the reason it's working so well in here is why did Christy Clark stop, Michael, the program escalation of the tax going up? If it's working so well, why did she stop it? Quite simply, she stopped it because at $30 per ton, BC's price in carbon is three times the price in carbon of any other province in the Federation. And British Columbia rightfully said, we are not going to further increase it beyond $30 a ton until the rest of the country catches up. BC's model works. That's why the BC Liberals have been elected and re-elected for the last 10 years. We need to take this model and export it to the rest of the country. Others on this? No. Okay. Right, uh, Ms. Reid, you have to. You have to okay, okay. One more question. Well, uh, this is for uh, group number two. Uh, Mr. Peterson, I think, in this case, will respond first. Then Mr. Shear, then Mr. Trost. So, politicians are always saying that their rivals are unwilling to share hard truths with the public. And that's been heard again in this race. So, take it to the next level. What is the one hard truth? that Justin Trudeau will not tell Canadians. Justin what? <laughs> Justin Trudeau will not tell the young people here that he is putting you so far in debt, so far in the hole, that you're going to be living in your mom and dad's basement for the next 15 years. Justin Trudeau will not tell you that the interest payments on the debt are costing each family today $2,400. A working family, two parents that are working, $2,400. Justin Trudeau will not tell people today under his father's leadership the same path he's on, interest rates at 18%, economy flat. Justin Trudeau will not tell that truth. Everybody up here will. And that's the difference between Justin Trudeau and us. I don't know there's much that Justin Trudeau has told the truth on. He said that we're going to get small $10 billion deficits. We saw what happened to that. We said 
We heard promises on electoral reform. We know he abandoned that. We've heard all kinds of broken promises from Justin Trudeau. But the biggest thing that he's doing is the exact opposite of the Canadian experience. Whether people have been in this country for multiple generations or newcomers who come here, at the Canadian experience is that we sacrifice for today to create a better opportunity for our children. We go without today. We live above a store or behind a restaurant, put money away so that our children have better opportunities. What Justin Trudeau is doing is reaching into my children's future, taking their prosperity to spend on his political purposes today. That's what's at stake in the next election. I agree with, with both of my two colleagues. I think part of the problem is Justin Trudeau has actually never had to work hard in his life. So he actually doesn't have to work hard. I'm not even trying to be mean to the guy. He doesn't actually understand that you have to put money away, you have to save it, you have to work hard, you have to sacrifice to get things in life. Don't begrudge anyone who is rich, good for you, but not all of us were born with trust funds. And this is something. Canada's trust fund is being spent not just for now, but for the future. He's not telling anyone that. It took 20 years to dig this country out of the mess that his father made. We need to stop him before it takes another 20 years for his death. Mr. Peterson. I'm going to burn my last 30 second card to tell you what I will deliver on. And everybody who is an EDA member of Vancouver Centre, under Roy Grinchpan, everybody who's a conservative worker across Canada, as leader of the party, starting on May 28th, I'm going to go across every riding and I'm going to raise funds for you and we're going to put $5,000 back in your hands in every riding to do events like this, to get a website, to get a Twitter account, and to grow this party from the grassroots. This is Rick Peterson's promise. I will deliver. Thank you. Yeah, I think the main truth that he won't tell, because he doesn't know it himself, is about debt. That debt matters in this world. Uh, we saw Canada in the mid-1990s, thanks to the debt that was accrued under his father, approach a crisis, approach a point where we might have needed an IMF program. And today, we see Justin Trudeau lecturing European audiences on Canada's great experience about how they should be more generous to people who need a hand up, while he himself is doing exactly what much of Europe did over the last 20 years that led to a European financial crisis. It is hypocrisy, it is lack of understanding, debt matters, and a Conservative government will deal with that issue and will brighten the future for Canadians by dealing with that issue. Mr. Saxon. Canada is known to be a place where it doesn't matter where you come from, what your name is, or what you do. If you work hard and persevere, you can achieve financial security for you and your family and create opportunities for your children. This is becoming harder and harder to achieve. I call this the Canadian dream. But I can tell you when the federal government takes more and more money out of your paycheck to pay more and more in taxes, and takes more and more money from our future generations by taking us deeper and deeper into debt, it's not helping Canadians achieve their dreams. As Prime Minister of Canada, I will ask my government every day, what are we doing to help Canadians achieve their dreams? Mr. Ochoa. Thank you. The question was, what deep, dark secret won't Trudeau tell Canadians after his first year as Prime Minister? That secret is the budget doesn't balance itself. <laughs> uh, Mr. Trump, I think Trudeau's biggest, darkest secret is the cynicism that he showed British Columbians and Canadians when he campaigned in the last election on electoral reform, knowing full well he had no intention of carrying it through if he were to form a majority government. It is a shame that he would conduct politics that way. I believe in democratic reform. I'm the member of parliament who introduced the Reform Act. I'm the candidate in this leadership race that has a real commitment to reforming our parliamentary institutions to give power back to you, the people and grassroots Conservative Party members. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to just digress a bit from uh, the format because uh, Ms. Rake has to catch a flight. Yeah. And um, so this will be our final question eventually for all of you. We still have one more ring that we'll undertake. So we'll give Ms. Rake the question first so then she can flee from the airport. Um, we don't have Uber here. You have to take a cab. Uh, <laughs> The best idea that you've heard from another candidate, and how would you use that idea to recapture seats 
that BC lost in the next election. Um, the best idea that you hear from all candidates is about lowering taxes, and I think that's incredibly important for anybody. Balancing budgets, lowering taxes is the bread and butter of being a conservative party, and all of us agree on stage that that's the direction we have to go in because that's what actually grows the economy. I'm going to digress into what would be our normally closing commentary while I do have to go and unfortunately utilize a large carbon footprint of flying across the country back to Toronto at 5.30. What you're picking in a leader tonight, not only is whether or not you agree with their policy ideas, because quite frankly, platform will be decided by all of us in the room going forward at the grassroots. But what you are looking at amongst us is who is going to do the best engagement with Canadians and convince them to give us their vote again, to give us their trust, to listen to the Conservatives and listen to their brand and want them to feel comfortable within our family again because they've been comfortable in the past and we want them to come back. We need somebody who can engage, engage with women, with people who live in the suburbs, who live in urban areas, and people who live out east in Atlantic Canada and people who live in British Columbia. Now, I have leadership experience in cabinet and private sector. I was the CEO of the Toronto Port Authority. I have experience in my life in making really tough decisions in difficult circumstances. The medal of a minister and the medal of a prime minister is not what happens when everything is smooth. It's what happens when you're faced with great circumstances that are out of your control and the decisions you take and the calmness with which you make them. And the third thing is life history is important because of this. The life history helps people identify with the individual. And standing next to Justin Trudeau in 2019, what people will see in me is somebody who grew up in Cape Breton, came from modest means, but was able to do well because of opportunity that was given to me along the way. What they'll see in Justin Trudeau is somebody who broke every promise that he made to the electorate in order to get power. And then he spent four years ignoring. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I thank you very much for being here. So well done, Vancouver Center. So we're going to go back now to uh, group three. That's uh, a smaller group all of a sudden. And uh, I think in this case here, um, Mr. Alexander and Mr. Saxon. So, Mr. Alexander, um, we have First Nations in British Columbia that are seeking not only reconciliation, but greater certainty about their economic destiny. And yet, only eight of about 200 bands have what we you would call modern treaties. How would you advance negotiations? And what would you do to either revamp or strike down the Indian Act? Well, I think the Indian Act is going to be there until we have treaties and self-government for all First Nations and for all Indigenous Canadians. Uh, and my priority would be to set a deadline for completing the treaty process. We made a lot of progress over 10 years of Conservative government. The, the golden age of final agreements, agreements in principle, since the 1920s in Canada, but there is a long way to go, particularly in British Columbia, and I think we could complete the treaty process with every First Nation in this province and with the remaining First Nations across Canada in five years. I think we also need to work in a concerted way across the country with Métis to make sure that we are enrolling that community wherever they are represented and where they, wherever they have not yet organized in every province. There is a long way to go on the recognition front and only then can the economic opportunity begin. Mr. Saxon. I think setting a deadline is a good idea. I don't know whether five years is realistic or not, but I think we have to get going on this issue. We have to treat First Nations with the respect that they deserve. We also have to help them become self-sufficient. We have examples here in British Columbia, in the Soyuz, Chief Louis, for example, 100% employment in that particular band. We need to show these examples to other First Nations groups so that we can help them help themselves so that they can build up and become prosperous. Too many generations of First Nations have been living in poverty, and there's no need for it. We're a wealthy country. They should also share in the wealth of Canada. And I would certainly, as Prime Minister, make sure this is a priority, that we settle these treaties as quickly as possible so that First Nations can get on with the prosperity that they deserve. Mr. Blaine. 
if we keep on doing what we're doing, we'll get the same result. And the liberal are wasting money now on dismissing an Aboriginal women's study. We know what the cause is. The cause is communities that are isolated, isolate where there's no economic base, where there's drug problem and there's violence, and women are the victims. We need to address the issue at the core, which is to dismantle the reserve, empower the native, the individual, and give them the same right as any other Canadian to own a house and buy a house. I think it's very important that we deal with First Nations communities as honest broker, uh, dealing honestly with them about the issues that they face. But we have to be clear about a couple of things. There is not enough money in Ottawa to address the issues on reserve across this country. The answer is not more money from Ottawa. The second thing that we need to do is bring back the First Nations Accountability Act, which showed members on reserve where money was being spent. <laughs> spending their money, and taxpayers have a right to know where their tax dollars are going as well. I think the future of First Nations uh, wealth is the kids. I've worked as a, as a volunteer mentor with junior achievement, teaching financial literacy skills, inner city First Nations kids. That's the future. We've got to get deep with these kids and get them on the right track. Mr. Alexander? I, I think this issue is fundamental for Canada. It's fundamental for our economic prosperity for all of us, especially in British Columbia. We're only going to realize the potential of this province and of the whole country if we give First Nations certainty. And I think we only do that by completing the treaty process quickly, by investing in Aboriginal languages, by bringing Aboriginal stories closer to the center of the Canadian story. It has been here from the beginning. We should all know those stories. New Canadians, Young Canadians should be brought up in those stories. That is the way that reconciliation will happen. That is the way that we will be whole as a country. Were there others? No? Okay, so let's go to our last question. And uh, it, we'll each give you 45 seconds. Um, Ms. Raitt, uh, I think, thought that she actually had another minute to do a closing statement. So if, if, uh, if you all have your time here um, and still can do that, that's fine. We'll, uh, we'll do this question and then give you an opportunity to do a closing statement in the letter. Will that work for all of you? Yep. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, with that in mind, Mr. Saxton, just a reminder of the question. What's the best idea you've heard from another candidate, and how would you use that idea to recapture seats that British Columbia lost in the party in the next election? I, I've heard a lot of good uh, good ideas from my colleagues, because we've been together for the last five, five months. I think the number one issue that we need to deal with is party renewal in the Conservative Party. We have to listen to our grassroots once again. In the last election, we lost track of our grassroots and we saw the results of, of what happened. We also have to, to uh, embrace young Canadians. We lost young Canadians in the last election. We need a strategy for social media, for example. Uh, we didn't have a strategy in the last election. Our strategy was to stay off social media and we saw the results of that. We have to reach out to the cities. We didn't win a single seat in the three largest cities in Canada in the last election, which means we have to deal with the issues that people living in the cities are dealing with, such as housing affordability, transportation, and jobs. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. I've heard great ideas from all of my colleagues, uh, but one that sticks in my memory is Stephen Blake mentioning nuclear power. I live between two nuclear power stations in Ontario. It is a clean, sustainable, safe source of energy, and we should build on it. We should also have a sensible energy policy for all of Canada. Nuclear, yes. Hydro, yes. Clean tech, yes. And oil and gas that we take in an intelligent and safe way to all the markets around the world. Immediately. Yes, we can help defeat Vladimir Putin's influence in Europe by building Energy East and by taking oil and gas to Europe. But we can also take our energy products to Asia safely we can be intelligent about coastal safety, maritime safety here on the BC coast, and we should eventually move the transportation of oil from Burrard Inlet to somewhere safer, closer to Tiber, closer to the ocean. Mr. Peterson. As Prime Minister in 2019, I will take Andrew Spunk, I will take Chris's diplomacy, I will take Brad's strong sea social conviction, I will take Andrew's leadership as a congenial guy in the whole things together. I will take Michael's fierce defense of democratic reform. You can't take my hair. I will use... <laughs> <laughs> I will take Aaron O'Toole's decency and understanding of the military 
and I will take Stephen Blaney's passion and the ability to swim across the St. Lawrence together. This is my cabinet. I invite you on July the 16th. <laughs> this is my cabinet, this is my team, and we're going to win in 2019. Thank you. <laughs> If I was to adopt maybe not so much the details but the concept, I'd probably take from Michael Tong's concept and push for democratic reform. And I do it for two basic reasons. Number one, there's nothing more fundamental than having the people of Canada be responsible for ruling their own country. That is what representative responsible government is about. So even, don't worry about the details, it's the underlying concept that we continue to empower the people. We're the world's third oldest democracy and it's important that we continue to do it. And secondly, a lot of Canadians are not left-wing or right-wing. They just want to be respected and listened to. And that's what democracy is all about. And we need to put that back and be a democratic, conservative party. Mr. Chair, uh, all the candidates up here have very innovative approaches to reducing taxes, balancing the budget, and growing the economy. I like what Maxime Bernier is talking about, deregulation of, of our telecoms and our uh, industries that have, have become burdened by excessive regulations. And I like the fact that Michael Chong is talking about CMHC and the fact that it can very much distort markets. And that's what a good leader does. A good leader listens to the people that he puts in cabinet, finds that area of common ground that unites conservatives. Because that's the other thing that you need to consider as you select who you want to lead, lead this party. Who can keep our conservative party together? Who can find the common ground between all the different kinds of conservatives and make sure that they feel welcome in our party and excited to work in the next election? Well, I, I like the idea of uh, Brad Trost, uh, Andrew Scheer, and Pierre Lemieux, who have consistently said that social conservatives have a welcome home in our party. Now, I'm not a social conservative. I support gay marriage, I support the transgender bill rights, and I support other minority rights in this country. But that said, I know that social conservatives are a welcome and important part of our party. And that's a message that needs to carry through this leadership race and beyond. We are a big 10th coalition. The next leader of the party has to keep the coalition together, and that starts by building a much more inclusive, a much bigger conservative party that includes Canadians of all races, all religions, all creeds, that's focused on an agenda to create economic, economic opportunity for all Canadians. Thank you. I'm going to support the hometown boy, Andrew Saxton. Uh, I, I actually like his plan to get back to balance, and it's detailed and he's put it out there. I'm one of the only candidates who's done the same. My policies aren't a 140 character tweet. They're detailed and, and deliberate. We can't suggest that Canadians will come back to us if we make fanciful claims that we're going to go to 0% tax or a flat tax and tackle the Trudeau deficit and meet other commitments. Let's talk about priorities. Let's talk about how we will deliver things. And that's what I've been doing in this race. Achievable, deliverable, and then that will win the trust back of voters here in the Lower Mainland and the GTA where I am. If we win back their trust with a new leader and a fresh approach, we will win the next election. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, like I spent 20 years in environment, so uh, how can we reconcile being a conservative and green? And Chris uh, Alexander said that I brought this nuclear idea. What I must say, if you watch a video of Deepak O'Brien in a basement, he talks of fast neutron reactor first. So why do we get those, this is 40 billion we would bury in the ground, 40 billion dollars that we can recycle. The problem with nuclear is, is, the, uh, is the waste. Now we can use those waste and turn it into green energy, reducing our, our carbon footprint. It's a wonderful solution and it's come from uh, the leadership race. For me, the leadership race, a leader is all about trust. Uh, vote for the person you trust, Brad, it's, I'm not talking of you, and, uh, and thank you for coming here, uh, and thank you for being conservative in Vancouver, we need more, and uh, merci. All right, so. so, I'm trying to figure out the order of the closing statements, because, you know, we often go one side to the other. Oh, it was not the closing statement. No, no, it was not the closing statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like it. <laughs> um, anyway, so I thought what we'd do is uh, we'll go in order of whose birthday is next. 
Who was the closing expert? May 20th. March? September. March? May. Anybody do better than March 20th? Monday, really. Like, <laughs> one minute. Or sorry, four, uh, 45 seconds. Sorry. sorry, 45 seconds. For the last five months, I've been traveling across the country from coast to coast, talking to Canadians about what, are, what is important to them. The issues that keep coming up over and over again, people are worried about their jobs and they're worried about the economy because this Trudeau government is the most economically inept since the last Trudeau government. People are also concerned about the debts and the deficits that this government is, is racking up. They're calling Justin Trudeau the trillion dollar man. Well, it's actually a trillion and a half dollar man. We need a leader who understands and knows how to grow the economy and how to create jobs and how to balance the budget. I'm that leader. I have over 30 years experience in finance. I've worked for two of the world's largest banks in five countries. I've worked with Jim Flaherty as his parliamentary secretary, and I was part of the finance team that balanced the budget just two years ago. And that's why yesterday I announced my new plan to balance the budget again, which I will do. It's on andrewsaxton.ca. I need your support to win. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Who's the, uh, who's the April uh, birthday uh, morning? April. April, okay. Yeah. So, okay, second, uh, second closing. My campaign is based on security, stability, and prosperity. Some will say we only want to talk about the economy. But what is the economy? It's people. And what are Canadian people? People who can live together, respect each other, and especially welcoming all those people we are welcoming. I feel it is important that we really clearly specify who we are with our core values, the equality between men and women. I believe this is important to have this discussion because we can see there's tension and the way to channel it is to talk about it in a respectful, democratic way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Who's in the May? May? May what? Oh, which May which May? May 20th. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a full four years older than him anyway. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Tonight is about rebuilding our party, about making our party greater. We all understand up here that you're not choosing the next president of Canada. You're choosing the next prime minister, first among equals. Someone who needs to be able to work together with the entirety of the field here. And that is my goal. I talk about being a 100% conservative, a broad spectrum conservative. Each of you join the Conservative Party because of something that makes you conservative. I can share with you, I can connect with you on those values. I ask for your support. I prefer to be your first ballot choice, but I'll happy to be your second. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, and a big thank you to the Vancouver Center EDA for this honor. What a great demonstration of our grassroots strength in this party. We all agree on so much up here. We all agree on the importance of strong families, of lower taxes, and balanced budgets. I've been unveiling some innovative policies to reduce taxes for new parents, to enshrine property rights in our Constitution, and to balance the budget in an aggressive but possible two years. But the biggest question that you all have to ask yourselves is which leader do you want to see on stage articulating those conservative values in the next election? That's what was missing last time. We weren't able to build a positive vision for our country. We weren't able to convince Canadians that conservative policies actually improve their quality of life. I know I can take our rock solid conservative message and bring it to a broader audience of Canadians and win in the next election. I'm asking for your support. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, it's, um, we're through May, right? We're into June, through May, June, May, July's, May, August's, September's. Which, uh, which, which? Nine, three. Yeah. <laughs> Is everybody tired of having Hetty Fry representing here? Yeah. yeah. I'm a winner. I like right to here. win. I compete every day. I'm in this private sector. I compete for clients. I compete for market share. And I want to win with you. I want to win this race. And I want to win as Prime Minister because I think and I know that Vancouver Centre deserves better than Hedy Fry. With me as your Prime Minister and as your leader, we're going to win. It takes three things to beat Justin Trudeau. You've got to have an economic plan, zero corporate income tax, 50% flat tax, grow the economy, that's the plan. You have to speak French. Il faut parler français et pour pouvoir débattre Justin Trudeau quand il est là avec vous, pas avec un binder, mais en vrai. You have to have grassroots support. You have mine. You have my pledge. I have your back. 
please follow me at petersonleader.ca. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thanks to all of you for being here, for giving your Sunday afternoon to this debate, to democracy in Canada, to the Conservative Party of Canada. We appreciate it. But we need to think about the future. We need to bring ourselves together. We need to think about how we win ridings like this, how we win in every part of the country, how we show ourselves to be who we know we are. We are an inclusive party. We are the best choice for the economy of this country. We are the best choice for innovation. We are not the party of fear and divisions. We are the party of a strong, free Canada, a Canada that is open for business, that will be second to none as a trading partner, and that will build a future for young people, build a new economy that is the envy of the world, and be strong for generations to come, because conservative leadership is coming back to town in 2019. Thank you. Mr. Trump. We need a leader who can grow the Conservative Party. I'm the father of three children. My wife and I have three young boys. And we need a leader who understands the challenges of raising a young family in a rapidly changing society. I live on a farm. I'm the only leadership candidate that lives on an operating farm. We have 185 acres in southwestern Ontario. And we need a leader who understands Canadian agriculture and understands our rural and remote communities. I'm the kid of immigrant parents, a Chinese immigrant father, and a Dutch immigrant mother. And we need a leader that understands how to re-earn and rebuild trust with Canada's immigrant communities. I'm also a candidate that's had private sector experience. I worked for 10 years in financial services in downtown Toronto. And we need a leader that understands the value of the dollar. And we need a leader who can win. I've won five times in the greater Toronto area, but I can't do it without your help. Join my campaign at Chong.ca. Together, we Thank can you. build the winning coalition. Thank you very much. And Mr. O'Toole. Thank you very much for being here and being part of our party. This campaign, there's great people in this race, is about who can win the next election. Who can beat Justin Trudeau? And to win, we have to win back here in the Lower Mainland. We have to win where I held on, in the 905 GTA area of Canada. We have to speak to those people and the issues that matter to them. I'm the only candidate in this race that served in the military, extensive work in the private sector, served in parliament and then in cabinet, fixing a problem in our last government by reaching out, building bridges and communicating to Canadians. That's why I have more support from MPs in British Columbia and in Ontario than all other colleagues. They know I can beat Justin Trudeau in the next election, but to do that, I need your help. Go to aeronotool.ca and join the mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. So that concludes our, uh, our debate today. I'm going to hand it back now to Glenn Arthur, and I want to thank you for your attention. Yes. And I hope that the questions have uh, been relevant and fair, and that you feel that the, uh, the candidates have answered them uh, to the best of their ability. Kurt from Mary. Kurt from Mary. Kurt from Mary. Another round of applause for the candidates for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. Now, uh, just a reminder to uh, get a membership if you don't already have one. There's membership forms back uh, at, uh, in the lobby, and uh, there's uh, some candidates will be around to go for the next 15 to 30 minutes. Um, just to close out the night, I'd like to invite you guys can take off. I'd like to invite Roy Grinchman just to say a, a couple of words on, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee and uh, to, to take us home. So, Roy. Well, you're not going well, anywhere, Grant. <laughs> so first, I'd like to thank our MC who uh, just burned the midnight oil like there was no tomorrow. Oh, there we go. See, and, and my coach. Um, so, uh, Glenn has put through just a heroic effort. He did the tremendous graphics that you saw, the staging. He corralled me when I said, we got to get another question in, another question in, another question in. Um, so the reason you're able to leave in about two minutes is because of Glenn. Um, I also want to thank uh, Herman Nielsen, who uh, proposed this venue, 
Mike and Laura, who did calls for ticket sales. Um, I want to thank our candidate of record, Elaine Allen, who corralled volunteers for us. I want to thank uh, James and um, Peter, who did questions uh, committee for us. And Peter is responsible for recruiting our fantastic moderator, Kirk LaPointe. Let's hear it again for him. Kirk. timing on stage, but was also doing the outreach for our campus clubs, and I thought that was a great element tonight, so you got me there. Thank you for that. Thank you to our campus clubs of all types. Um, there's Wara right there doing social media and photography. Thank you very much for doing that for us. Uh, and now I want to just do a little reach out to some of the other EDAs that, uh, that have supported us. So this all started when Van Selt said we should get some EDAs together and bring the candidates out here. Um, so I want to give a shout out to them for inspiring this for us. I want to thank uh, Fritz in Port Moody, uh, Eric in North Van, and Brock in Burnaby South for doing great publicity for us. They sent out an email blast to help get the tech sales going. Frank and Giffon, DDO, who did a debate on Monday and did a debrief for us on what worked and what didn't. So we've done uh, cooperation across the country with other EDAs, as well as our local partners for the BC Mega Weekend. This is day two. Day one was yesterday in Abbotsford and uh, Cloverdale. Uh, Mission Mass Week all did a great job with the super debate, and I want to thank Steve Schaefer and Mark Vella for their, uh, for their mentorship in this as well. Uh, I've mentioned EDAs a couple of times. What is an EDA? It's an electoral district association, and it's the people who brought you this event. We're all volunteers, we're all grassroots, and it's super fun. You should join us. We're having elections in June for a new board, and I'm hereby recruiting anybody here who's interested. The stuff that you get to do here is super cool with all the candidates, and once that's all over, it, it's not over. Next comes policy convention. We can come up with great new policies for the candidates to debate in the general election in the platform. So please give some thought to joining our EDA or any other EDA that you're from. Uh, the last, okay. Okay. <laughs> the uh, I also want to thank our sponsors. None of this would have been possible without the generous financial support, not only of our ticket buyers but also our sponsors. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think I've got pretty much everything, but our uh, so this is an all volunteer organized event at the grassroots. But we did get a little bit of assistance from our professional staff. I want to thank Christine, our regional organizer in BC, who corralled the media and gave us some tips on what we're working with. Uh, I also want to thank headquarters for putting together the graphics that were used in the email blast and for some general guidance. So thank you to Dustin and Joel and Stephen McCreary uh, on that end as well. Um, once again, I thank all of you for coming out. Uh, and spending your time and uh, learning more about our phenomenal team uh, of conservative talent uh, here um, that's, and the issues that are at play at our next convention, or sorry, at our next uh, election, so that you guys can be more informed voters when you pick the leader of our party who's going to make us a great nation again and send Justin Trudeau to become a teacher again. <laughs> and last but not least, the BC Mega Weekend is not over. We're going party. This was a killer event to vote on. And I invite you all to join us for three different candidate parties that are happening right now. So there's an after party at Doolin's for Karen O'Toole. There's one at Cavo for Rick Peterson. And then there's one, uh, which is the latest one, in, uh, at the Village Bistro with Chris Alexander. So if anybody needs any info, just talk to any of those campaign teams or any member of the uh, Vancouver Center Board. But come party with us and, uh, and enjoy some more one-on-one -on -one time with the candidates. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>